What's up, Nerds? Some of you guys know that some cool lore about me is that my first plunge into deep lore was from a visual dictionary book from the original trilogy. It just added so much awesome detail that it made it feel real. So no matter what you thought about this movie, this book is pretty interesting. And in this video, we'll cover 36 cool facts from the Rise of Skywalker visual dictionary. Of course, there will be a ton of spoilers in here. You've been warned, so let's get started. Mustafar is confirmed as the opening world, and they're actually fighting against Vader-worshipping cultists. They all set up camp around the ruins of Vader's castle, and that was where Vader's Wayfinder was hidden. Also, that thing that Kylo would rest the helmet on was a piece of Mustafarian obsidian. Janna is most likely Lando's daughter. Tons of stuff in this book points to that. They made it so that their timelines line up, and then it has Lando saying, quote, The First Order went after us. Leaders from the old wars. They took our kids. That's some pretty dark lore about the First Order, and we'll see if there's any future stories about these two. Also, Lando still has the Lady Luck, his upscale, personalized yacht, and he was actually hiding it on that desert world persona. And then that Mon Calamari with the Resistance is actually Akbar's son. The World Between Worlds, one of the craziest introductions from Star Wars Rebels, is actually referenced in the Jedi books, called the Chain Worlds Theorem and the Virgin Scatter. What's really cool is that R2-D2 has backed up all of these ancient texts. I think that's a really awesome fate for R2. A droid and so supposedly can't have any connection to the Force, but he's been one of, if not the most important character in the Skywalker Saga. Could easily be called the R2 Saga. And so now he's the greatest Jedi library of all time. We also learned that these texts contain the ancient healing technique, which we see her use a lot on screen, but also she used it to repair the kyber crystal from Anakin's lightsaber. And there's one more really cool detail from these books, that a certain Jedi Master Thorpe wrote The Phases of Mortis, which is a reference to that cosmic force arc from the Clone Wars TV show, but also an incredibly obscure callback to Chewie to Thorpe, a Padawan of Mace Windy, yes you heard that right, Mace Windy, who wrote The Journal of the Wills Part 1 the original title for the Star Wars film, and the in-universe name for the Skywalker Saga. And then we get some information on a whole bunch of dates. Ben Solo was born in the year 5 ABY, about a year or even perhaps nine months to the day after the Battle of Endor, and Leia gave birth to him on the planet Chandrilla, which was the home of Mon Mothma and the first capital of the New Republic. He started training at 10 years old, the year 15 ABY, and Luke's Jedi Temple was destroyed in 28 ABY. That's six years before the events of Episode 7. Babu Frick is 85 years old. Poe was run in Spice at the age of 16. Rey was 6 when she was abandoned, and born around the year 16 ABY. She's 20 years old in The Rise of Skywalker, and Kylo Ren is 30. Maz Kanata is born in 973 BBY, just 27 years after the Legends Bane destroyed the Sith Empire, where he then instituted the Rule of Two, and thinking that there were no more Sith, the Jedi gave up their military role. Also, BB-8 was made in 29 ABY, so he's 6 years old. And speaking of kids, the soldiers and crew of the Sith Eternal are the children of those Sith cultists, those robed characters that were all watching Palpatine. And that short scene where we saw Leia and Luke training was on the planet Ajin Klaus, the forest world from this film that was now the Resistance's new base. And then supposedly Sith alchemy was used to repair Kylo Ren's helmet. Don't really know how or why, but that's what it says. Nin Nub was piloting the Tantive IV, and that is the largest ship in the Resistance at this time. His co-pilot was descendant from Alderaanians. His ancestral home was destroyed before he was born, but there were many Alderaanians off-world when the Death Star attacked. We also learn that Chewie lent the Falcon to Hondo Onaka, a pirate from the Clone Wars in Rebels TV show. That big snake thing that Rey heals is a Vexus, and these little guys with the big ears are called Okie Pokey. We learn that the Centrists, planets that wanted strong centralized control over the galaxy, seceded from the New Republic five years before the Starkiller incident, and they would become aligned with the First Order. And we learned that Leia left politics the year before. It's a really interesting dynamic that's explored in the novel Bloodline, probably one of the best new canon books. We finally get confirmation that Starkiller base was Ilum, the sacred Jedi world that housed countless kyber crystals, part of a timeless tradition in which Padawans took their first step towards building a lightsaber. Starkiller construction started in the year 4 ABY, and would take the next 30 years. And when it was destroyed, it turned into a sort of mini star that perturbs hyperspace. And this obstacle is nicknamed the Solo. So somewhere out there, some nerf herder will be explaining to a farm boy that you can't just blindly jump into hyperspace, you might run into a planet, an asteroid, or even a Solo. This guy Pride from the Sith Eternal fleet actually saw Vader in action. And so though he's not Force-sensitive, he understands that this weird Sith stuff comes with the territory if you want strong leadership. We find that the Wayfinders were ancient technology that were made in part by dissecting Purgle, 
The Dyad prophecy is nearly identical to the ancient Sith text that inspired the Rule of Two, so some suggest that grammatical things like inflection marks and line breaks in the Old Tongue Sith writing could have led to these two different interpretations. There's a ton on the Knights of Ren and their weapons and their ship, which we cover in separate videos, but here's a good look at their names and some of their weapons. We learn that the UATT was directly inspired by the Clone Wars era ATAP, and that Ochi was an associate of Yuk Tashu, and also worked with the Acolytes of Beyond, Sith worshipping cultists that loved Vader and Sidious that started to rise up right after the fall of the Empire. And so that's it for just some of the cool facts from this book. Of course, there's a ton more and with more context, so if you want to pick that up or any other cross sections books, be sure to check out the links in the description. Let me know what you thought of the movie down in the comments below, and if you feel like any of this information adds to that experience, or has you excited for future Star Wars material. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon. Be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, one like equals one prayer for those innocent kids born into Sith cultist families. And the Force will be with you, always.